Catherine, how are you today? I'm wonderful. I'm so excited to be here. How about you? I'm doing really great. I am super excited for you to be here today. I, it's probably worth noting that I'm a huge Etsy fan. So this, this podcast is not brought to you by Etsy, but I will fangirl all over Etsy today. Even as I was preparing for this today, I'm walking through my house just thinking all the stuff I bought from Etsy. There's at least one or two items in every room. So I'm a huge fan. I'm excited to hear about your job at Etsy. Uh, but let's start off by understanding a little bit more about you and your career journey. Can you talk about you know your career journey and what's led you to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. I'll first start out by saying thank you for your love of Etsy. I also <laughs> am equally obsessed and I'm so grateful to work to work at this company. And we love our buyers, we love our sellers. So thank you for outfitting your house with all of their, their amazing wares. They really are incredible. Um, I also have many, many Etsy things in my house and I call it field research for work, but it's just you know, the, you know, the thing about Etsy is, Etsy is even if, well, I mean, there's like a bajillion things, but even if you, if I have something in mind that I want and I find something similar, this has happened multiple times where I'll contact, you know, the, the seller and I've had things special made and it's, they're just like, absolutely 100% will do that for you. Completely. And they're amazing and so talented, so kind. And the, they are true artisans in every form of the word. So yeah, the, the sky is the limit with the stuff you can find on Etsy and the stuff that you can personalize through through our makers. Yeah, I've never had a bad experience at oh, all that with makes Etsy. Me so so happy. yeah, and it's always like when I want something like when my brain goes, I want something really cool for this gift or for this wall. I'm like Etsy. It just comes to my brain. So you 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 all have a great soft spot in my heart and in my brain. Uh, I just I really think a lot of Etsy and what what you do there. So I'm I'm so excited today. Oh, that makes me so happy. Well, I'm so thrilled to be here. Like I said, and I'm happy to share a bit about what I was doing before I got to Etsy. Um, basically, always I've had a passion for female entrepreneurship and girls' education and the economic empowerment of women. And uh, so in my college years and in my internships, I focused on that and that really solidified that passion for me. I interned at a few nonprofits and felt compelled by that, but I also was missing this creative side that I've always had. And so I thought advertising could be a cool way to inform societal conversations. I've seen the power of advertising to create really good social conversation. And so I thought I wanted to be part of that. So I got into advertising and um, I did some traditional and non-traditional roles. I had a bunch of great clients. I had clients across P&G and American Express, Starbucks, Gerber, Southwest. Those were all companies that I really loved and believed in. So I loved working um, with them as my clients. But after a few years of being in the industry, I felt like I was getting away from that intention. The advertising industry that I joined felt different than what I'd expected and I felt like I wanted to go back in-house and kind of practice more of what I preached. And so then I found this role at Etsy, and I am so grateful to have found it. I didn't really even know what internal communications was, but I knew that I could write. I knew that I loved Etsy, and the role just seemed like it fit. And so I applied in 2018. I've been here ever since. And um, what's nice about it is that it kind of feels full circle. It feels like I've returned to my personal mission of the economic empowerment of women. That's what Etsy really stands for. And over 80% of our sellers are are women. And so it feels good to, to be doing work and service of that every day. That's that's fantastic. And I'm really glad to hear that. It makes me feel even better by how much I love Etsy by hearing that they're, <laughs> they're, they're doing good and emp economically empowering women. So that's fantastic. Talk about what you do in your role as the director of communications uh, at Etsy. Yes, so I'm the director of employee communications, and as many internal communicators probably know who, who might be listening to this, we wear many hats. Um, our team covers standard internal comms fair, like our weekly newsletter, we have our all hands, which we call y'all hands, our intranet, which we call the intranet, like knitting needles. Etsy oh my gosh, I love that. I, I am a sucker for a good metaphor and a, and a word pun, so oh. I love intranet. That's Yes. It's Love it. Etsy never shies away from the opportunity for a good pun. Uh, <laughs> so we cover that. We cover also just, you know, general ad hoc communications. And then we also manage the strategy and programming for our senior leadership team. So all directors and above at Etsy. We also support executive communications, crisis communications, and we also provide support for some of the internal comms functions for our subsidiaries. So let's move into our first segment, story time. Welcome to story time. 
So before Etsy, I know you were a dialogue strategist at Ogilvy. Can you explain what dialogue strategy is and what a dialogue strategist does? Yes. So I also did not know what dialogue strategy was or what a dialogue strategist did before I was at Ogilvy, but dialogue strategy is a type of advertising. Dialogue refers to the conversation between companies and customers. And so it was a bit of a mindset shift because when you think of adver- uh, when you think of advertising, you're probably thinking of how a brand shows up in like TV ads or radio ads or out of home spots. But when you talk to someone who is working at that company, so a customer service agent or a flight attendant or a barista, you know, they also are representing the brand. And so they need to sound like the brand that you know and love. And that's where that strategy part comes in. The question was, you know, how do you translate a brand identity into a tone of voice that could then be used by like hundreds or thousands of of employees around the globe? Um, And to give more texture to this, American Express is a great example. So if you've watched an American Express uh, commercial on TV, you've seen that they're really obsessed with member since. They love talking about their membership. It's all about being a, a member of American Express and making that feel really special. And that's why if you are a cardholder and you call into customer service, the first thing they do is say, thanks for being a member since, you know, 2005 or whenever you joined, that is dialogue strategy at work. That's bringing through what you've heard in the commercial into the touch point that you have with the customer facing employee. How did you translate that over? Like what skills and tactics did you take from dialogue strategy to, to move into like employee communications? Oh, so much. And it's so funny looking back because I had no idea that what I was doing as a dialogue strategist would become the career that I wanted to hang my hat on really. Um, there was so much psychology and pure writing and really getting in touch with what mattered to people, both from a customer perspective and from the employee's perspective. And so first and foremost, understanding how, you know, employing a consistent tone of voice is really critical in driving trust. There was such investment from the clients put into ensuring that their customer facing touch points reflected their business's tone of voice and priorities. And that was big in trust. They were willing to put their money where their mouths literally were. Also showing that true brand authenticity didn't stop with the external work. So showing up authentically isn't all about showing up really authentically in your commercials. You also need to show up authentically internally. The more you can live your brand internally, the more it translates externally, whether that's someone who is a customer facing employee or just someone who works at your company and is representing your brand, ensuring that it feels really cohesive externally and internally is critical. And then finally, just that like person to person communication is, or connection is so important. Uh, a big part of my role was being on the ground with the employees of my clients. And, you know, so we would develop the tone of voice that matched the brand voice. We'd then create assets and scripts and exercises and stuff to bring this to life for the field employees. And then we'd go to the client's call centers or the customer service vendors and train those frontline employees in embodying this tone of voice. And being on the ground with the employees of my clients made me realize that, like, I really wanted to go in-house. I wanted to talk with employees of which I was one, you know, I, I wanted to be part of that employee group rather than being a, uh, a consultant that would come in. And so that drove me to go in house, saw the job at Etsy, and it just felt like fate aligned. I have to imagine that those are, those almost are pretty similar roles, uh, like a dialogue strategist and, a, you know, an internal communications, you know, strategist or director or whatever level you're at, because you're still taking that, that brand identity and sort of working with employees on what it means and how they can demonstrate, you know, we talk about demonstrating company values and what that looks like and we give awards and all that. I have to imagine those are pretty similar. There's a lot of similar skill sets in there. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, when I, like I said, when I was a dialogue strategist, I didn't really, I didn't necessarily seek out that specific role. I knew I wanted to get into strategy. It was something that I loved. I loved brand strategy and I also really loved writing. And so when this role, when I, Uh, interviewed and and got the role as a dialogue strategist. Um, I bring this up because so often in your career, you look back at things that it can all seem like it was intentional, but it really isn't. And you just kind of take opportunities as they come. And I'm so grateful for the time that I had as a dialogue strategist because it awakened this whole new world of a career for me that I really didn't know existed and one that I really do love. So I feel so grateful. 
Yeah. You know, I, I hear that a lot. And I know that's been my experience that when I have had great opportunities, like even the one I'm in now, um, they just sort of happen, right? They sort of come up and I, I get interested in it. It wasn't because I designed it, a very strict path about where I was going. And it sounds like you've had, yeah, you've had a similar experience. I'm going to move us into our next segment, getting tactical. I'm trying to figure out tactics. So thinking about some of those skills that have transferred over, right? One of the most important skills that internal comms or employee comms can have is a relationship building across, across the organization with leaders. Would you talk about some of the key relationships that helps employee comms uh, be the best it can be? Yeah, for sure. I mean, how much time do you have? I really think <laughs> we, we've got really all day, think... Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really do think that employee comms is, is all about the relationships. And I'll start with the very basic ones. I think a lot of internal communications folks probably sit either within the comms slash marketing function or within HR. And that's for a reason. Both of those relationships are so critical. So with comms and PR, you need to make sure that your voice internally and externally sounds the same. And you need to make sure that you're you know, in lockstep when you're responding to more sensitive issues, especially. And then with HR, internal comms is all about communicating to employees and supporting the employee experience and the core initiatives that affect the employee experience come out of HR. And so having a good relationship with both of those teams is so important because you're going to be working with them constantly. Both of those teams are like my very best friends. Um, what's unique at Etsy though my team sits within our strategy and operations function, which rolls up to our um, our VP of strategy and ops and our, our COO. And uh, I really love that. I think it's a really critical relationship. What we call strategy and operations, other companies might see as chief of staff roles, but each org at Etsy has a strategy and operations function. And those have been some of the most fruitful relationships I have across the business because it allows me to understand what each of those org strategy is, what their priorities are, and having that connection to the full large scale business strategy and company priorities, you're able to ensure that that's pulled through in all of the communications touch points so that employees are focusing on the right things, which are, you know, the business. Um, yeah, focusing on the right things. And then there are a couple more that I think I, I would be remiss to not mention, but IT. IT is a huge one. I think Carolyn Clark has often said that IT is like the peanut butter to comms is jelly. I completely agree with that. IT is such an important partner to, to stay close with. Um, executives, obviously, that's super important. Executive assistants are a really valuable relationship to, to build. And just generally always looking to make friends. Like I think friends and relationships that you have anywhere across the business, across levels or orgs are so critical to be, to be strong in internal comms. Agreed. And you, you know, at any level, you know, I'm, I'm like you, I would just make friends with everyone um, that I possibly could, you know, you can, you know, people you can, like, I would often, you know, know a lot of people. So then you can use them as almost canaries in the coal mine, right? How, how did that land, right? You, you must have your own little focus group that you can email people. What did you think about the, the town hall today? Right. And if, if you're really good work friends, you know, they may, they would probably feel really comfortable telling you how they feel as opposed to sort of, you know, survey, I gave it a five, I gave it a four, which is so important to get that real honest feedback. Truly. And seeing how, seeing how things make people feel so much is lost in a survey and so much is hidden when you're typing. And so really having those relationships you can draw on both for the good stuff and the bad stuff is, is so critical. And I, I absolutely love that you call out executive assistants. I, I think that that's a group that often gets overlooked, honestly. Um, you know, we do talk about HR and IT a lot in employee comms. And you're absolutely right. My, my HR VP business partner was always, it was like me and her, her and I, everywhere we, I mean, every meeting we would be there together. And if, oh, we need to invite her, I, I won't give her name, but uh, if we need to invite her and, and she do the same for me, but the executive assistant, I think is something that's widely overlooked. Um, and, and can you talk about the value there? I, I just feel as if that one doesn't get talked about as much as HR and IT. Absolutely. I think when executives are such a key customer for internal comms, their executive assistants are usually the people that know them the best. They know what makes them tick. They not only know their availability, but they also know how they're feeling about certain topics, things that are on their mind. And depending on the scale of your organization or the way that your company is set up, it can be difficult to have that close of a relationship personally with the executives that you're trying to support and ensuring that you have that relationship with their executive assistant, you're able to just kind of like casually keep in touch on key issues. That way you can help the executives show up in the moments that matter on topics that are authentically ones they care about and also make sure that you aren't, you know, 
forgetting to consult them on something. I think executive assistants have so, so much insight and, and power and value. And it's just been such a valuable relationship for, for me to have. I've been so grateful for that at Etsy. Absolutely. A uh, good example. I, I, I don't mind if I give an example here, but I was working at a company and we were changing the, the travel policy and how, how people booked travel and the people who travel the most were the executives. And so that was a group that I hadn't been utilizing was executive assistants. And, and my boss at the time said, you know, you, you should get them all together. And I was like, oh my gosh, they're the ones that use the systems the most. They do the expense reports for the executives. Um, so I just, and, and then I did, I pulled them all in. They gave great feedback and it helped get their buy-in because they, they were consulted and, and they provided value. They, they gave real feedback and I was able to make changes and, you know, work with a project team. But I think that's just one of, one of many good examples of, you know, how they can be utilized. Plus when you need to get in to see an executive and their calendar's pretty, calendar's pretty booked, <laughs> it can be, it can be very beneficial to be friendly, you know, friends with, with the executive assistants to help, help make your job just a little bit easier. Absolutely. Yeah. So a lot of times internal comms does tend to focus on the senior level executives. Um, when you think about non-senior leaders and even outside of those executive assistant, um, what are some, what are, uh, what about non-senior leaders, you know, at, at all, and I'm talking all levels, individual, individual contributor could be, you know, first year people leader, um, help us understand why building those relationships are just as important. I mean, just think about your ratio, right? Like the the people that you're communicating to, there are way more non-senior leaders than there are senior leaders. And I thought for a while about what metaphor would make sense here for how I try to think about internal communications. And I came to, for better or for worse, like a two-way billboard. Basically, we need to make sure that internal communications tells employees the key messages and focuses from leadership. But then we also need to make sure that we're telling leadership what's on the mind of employees. And so like I said earlier, you're always looking to make a friend. It is so valuable to um, to build those relationships across the company. And then you're then closer to the, the ground. You have an ear on the ground for what's going on in your company. You have your finger on the pulse. And that's a huge value that you can provide to senior leaders for those who are trying to develop those relationships as well. Um, and then I've also found it really useful to be super org agnostic and level agnostic, tenure agnostic when making friends. A friend is a friend. And it helps you be better at your job. It helps you, you know, stay more connected to what's going on. And I've also found it makes your job more enjoyable. Like you have a community of friends, you have a group of people that you like and naturally um, have, have a flow with. And so it's made my job feel even more fulfilling because of the friendships that I've been able to build across the company. Yeah, it's nice. You can go to, you can be in any situation, lunch in the cafeteria, at an ERG group meeting, um, out of town hall, and you walk in and you know, most of the people there and everyone's talking to you and asking questions, it does make your job a little bit more enjoyable because you're friends with a lot, you know, most of the employees or a lot of the employees. Yeah. And bringing that up, I think, uh, I know we're going to touch on this in a little while, but one of the obstacles right now, remote work has been fantastic and the opportunities from being distributed as a workforce are, are immense. But at the same time, it's hard to build those relationships. Mm -hmm. there, there isn't that casual, like, happen to be next to you in line in the cafeteria on a random Tuesday and strike up a friendship, it's hard to just randomly form a bond with someone. And so I think that's been um, a, a more focused obstacle for me over the last couple of years is how can I continue building those relationships with folks who are no longer in my vicinity five days a week that I'm seeing all the mm -hmm. time at the same, you know, lunch line or water cooler? How can I not be weird. Like I don't want to reach out on Slack and be like, hi, I think we should be friends. So it's, it's <laughs> I mean, a, that's how we have to do it now. I Who know, knows? You know? I know. Well, and it's weird when you want to, when you want to get to know, even like if you're new at an organization or, or somebody new comes in, you want to get to know them. You have to schedule a meeting with them, exactly. which feels so formal. Right. You know, before I, I very much felt like when I've worked in, in buildings, in offices before, where, and even when I go in to my, my office now, uh, I, you know, you just walk around and talk to people, Yeah. You know? oh, Hey, you know, thanks for that email. Or you can, you can start a conversation. Now you have to schedule time. Like it's a formal meeting, even getting to know leaders, right? You can't just run into the CFO in the cafeteria. You have to schedule time and then it becomes formal. Like, well, what are we talking about? And you exactly. want to, you want to have a friendly chat in there, but you also need to have content and, and purpose why you're being there. Not just, well, I just want to say hello and see how your weekend was, you know, completely. And that's, yeah. And you still want to find the time to stop and say, how was your weekend? You know, build yeah. that, that real interpersonal rapport. But 
at the same time with leaders, you need to think about what are those opportunities that you can use to get in front of them to start building those relationships authentically. It will be difficult for you to find time on their calendar or whatever. So, you know, is there a, a project where you can show up and it's more about, you know, showing your value than, than telling your value? How can you show the value that can provide to a leader that you don't have a close relationship with yet or who doesn't know the value of internal communications yet? And I think also, you know, people have said it all the time, you never let a good crisis go to waste. I feel like <laughs> crisis is where internal communicators can really shine. And so being able to show your value in moments like that and, and capitalizing on that to, to try to forge those relationships helps you in the long term, particularly when you don't have the benefit of catching your CFO in the hallway and saying, hey. I'm going to move into the next segment, Rimmed from the Headlines. You hear the news? Extra, extra, read all about we're it. seeing a lot. You, you mentioned tone, and I want to go back to that. It was very early on. So I, I, I want to go back because we're seeing a lot about empathy and compassion in the workplace. And a lot of that has to do with tone. But I want to talk about in corp, you know, using getting empathy and tone into a leader message, right? How do we do that? How do, as internal communicators, how do we incorporate empathy and compassion when we're writing something or creating a presentation for leaders? It's a great question. And I think what's most important is to focus on what makes that leader tick. And so I think it's useful to find that very authentic source of empathy and compassion, not what, not what they think others would say or not what they think others want to hear, but really what feels natural. And I found the most useful way to go about that is prep sessions. Whenever there's an important touch point, whether it's a two minute Slack video or a town hall presentation, an email, something, I think it's really useful to just have a meeting with them, 20 minutes, and just riff. Let them naturally share where their mind is going. I capture copious, copious notes. Type really fast, catch everything you can, engage with them and push them to kind of refine what they want to say. What is that authentic message that that they feel internally? And let that be your guide. And um, then it comes down to how do they like to operate from that point forward? So some people really like to have a script, but we know that we don't want people to feel scripted. And so do you take that long brain dump, turn it into a script, have them review it, and then shoot them off a couple of really quick like brain job bullet points to help them speak off the cuff? Do they want to do it a couple of times? Are they better in a pre-recorded um, forum rather than a, a live forum? Working with them to ensure that how they that they can show up really authentically with that empathy rather than infusing key empathy 101 messaging into a, a touch point, which will just feel hollow. The employees will feel it. The the speaker will feel it. You'll feel it. It just won't be as impactful as something that really does come from the heart. Well, well let me ask you this. I, there's probably some listeners out there that, that may be having this experience where you have leaders who aren't, who don't do the, I don't know how to say this, who aren't, who are more about like, you know, work and not so much about like feelings. And there's nothing wrong with that. They come to work to work and then maybe at home they, you know, have feelings. And and I, I uh, a few, a couple months ago, we did a podcast with a woman named Layla Taraf. She, she, that's how she was. She was very, very goal, like focused on work. But then she went through some tragedy and it helped her become more compassionate and empathetic. Now, I don't want ha leaders to have to go through some pretty, pretty awful tragedy and um, to have to feel that. So I'm wondering, how do you work with leaders who don't have some of those like a strong sense of empathy and compassion to help that shine through, let's say at a town hall? Absolutely. I mean, I'll start by saying that we are quite lucky at Etsy. I think a lot of our leaders are naturally empathetic. It's everything is about being human at Etsy and our, our leaders exemplify that. But at the same time, it can be difficult to get in the mindset of something that you need to address and a problem, a, an issue that someone feels intimately in the company may not be relatable to everybody else at the company. And so in those prep sessions, I found it really useful to try to contextualize it, make it feel personal, use you statements, try to make it a story where they can feel the emotion that the person might be feeling and be reminded of the, the context in which that person is having these emotions. That can usually unlock that, that empathy muscle if it's otherwise a little bit hidden due to the, the context or a stressful environment or something. There are many reasons why it could be hard to uncover that empathy muscle, but usually contextualizing it in in words that will make sense to the person and just getting back to that like true person to person connection. I think 
that will go a really long way. And I haven't found anybody that isn't able to understand from that perspective what someone is feeling. It's it's just about reframing and helping get into the mindset of the the um, audience that you're trying to address. So another key another p- key uh, piece of this is tone of voice. It's critical when building trust with employees, right? And employees, you know, we're communicators. Uh, people are communicators. We can see through robotic or disingenuous messages. So first, let's talk about and start with why does tone matter? Oh, I love this question. You know, I do. I, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, first and foremost, just having a consistent and really authentic tone is so critical for trust. And I love to use this example that you've probably heard before, but have you ever um, gotten an email and it says it's from your mom and the subject line is like, please help. And you're like, oh my gosh, okay, let me, let me read this email from my mom. My mom needs help. And then you read it and it says, you know, hi daughter, I'm in a situation. I need you to wire me (laughs) a million dollars in Bitcoin ASAP. Please help signed your mom. And the first thing that you think is like, that doesn't sound like my mom. I'm not going to wire her a million dollars in Bitcoin. I wouldn't be like, I don't be like, how do I even get Bitcoin? (laughs) Give me 10 minutes, mom. (laughs) (laughs) Give me 10 minutes to get a million dollars in Bitcoin. (laughs) No problem. Anything for my mom. Um, But yeah, like the, the thing about tone is that when it's reliable, a reliable tone breeds familiarity. And we all know that like familiarity is the the precursor to trust. And so- you know, when it comes to that example of the the phishing email, I'm familiar with my mom or most people who will email me, especially the way that she communicates. And because of that, I trust her and I don't trust this person that wrote the email because I know it doesn't sound like her. And so for the folks at your companies, for whoever's listening, like the more that we can breed familiarity with leadership, their authentic voice, all of that, then the greater your the greater trust the team will have and the better the business will be. And I know that that seems like a big jump, but there is actual data like backing up how trust impacts your your business's bottom line. And it's it's employees trust in their employer. And that's everything from uh, NPS to, to retention and engagement. These are all things that do affect your bottom line. And I won't bore you with like the details and the numbers, but I recommend checking out the Edelman Trust Barometer study. They, they release the report every year and it has a lot of interesting data about the impact of trust on businesses' performance, particularly for employees and their employers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, trust, trust, you know, that's why we're hearing a lot about transparency, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that we don't want leaders and our people managers delivering bad news. We want them to deliver the truth so that builds trust. So even when you get the news you don't want to hear or something bad happens, the, the trust is there. So it still keeps the bond really strong. You know, that that's, that's what I know, but I'll have to look that up. I don't know a bunch about that. Uh, that what did you call it? The Edelman, the Edelman Trust Barometer. Edelman Trust Barometer. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a look at that. Yeah. Well, so let's let's keep digging into to tone uh, and and voice. Um, I know I've seen you present this before, so I'm wondering if you would talk a little bit about the spectrum of tone and voice. Absolutely. So it can be a little abstract, um, but I'll try to break it down as best I can verbally and. I think I'll start with a basic foundation. Like most internal communicators at some point will need to be ghostwriters or editors. And I think it can be hard to keep track of all the different folks' voices that you have to master. And you also want to make sure that you're not infusing, you know, your own personal voice into the stuff that you're writing for others, because then everything will sound the same and pretty amorphous. And and that's not good for anybody. So after a lot of field work, <laughs> I boiled down most tones of voice into about four main components. And then you can kind of plot your leaders across these on a spectrum. The first being friendly or corporate. So friendly is on one side of the spectrum and corporate is on the other side. And choosing where you land here really just first and foremost depends on your company. And like, what is your leader's authentic vibe? Are they someone who starts out messages like, hi team, or hey, or do they start out messages with all, whatever their natural inclination is, that's where you should start that plotting. So you're not forcing them to be someone that they're not, no matter how much you wish the person who is very, you know, very uh, corporate could be a little more friendly or the person who's friendly could be more corporate. You gotta, you gotta lean into who you are authentically. So that's the first one. The, The second one is, are they conversational or informative? And that's a sliding spectrum as well. So is your speaker super avuncular? naturally, or are they really straight business? Are they more naturally to say something like, you all have heard a lot of the things that we've discussed around X topic. And so we've made the decision to move forward with Y decision, or are they very like, because of X, we're doing Y. You got to think about where you plot that. 
Then the third topic is accessible, accessible or advanced. And Accessibility means a lot of things. In this context, it means getting rid of jargon and like insider baseball terms that only really senior or super tenured folks would know. However, it can sound like a dirty word, um, but sometimes having it be more advanced is important. So say that all of your company, a, a precursor to joining your company is having a certain technical degree. If you begin to discuss components that are like basic to that found, to that degree, if you start discussing those things in a really elementary way, your employees are going to be like, I don't think my employer is very knowledgeable on this topic. Obviously, I know what this is. I'm going to lose some trust in them. So however, for other companies, if your employee base is really varied, which I think it is in most tech companies, for example, I often suggest starting out with like, explain it like I'm 10 years old and go from there. So that you can get to that really optimal level of simplicity and accessibility. Yeah, I, I get it. I, I love that just because I feel like that's where I really like to come in is, is for that reason. I know I've worked a lot with IT. We, we had talked about that earlier. And when they do something that that all that's going to impact all employees, it's you know they'll usually hand me content that's like really technical, and I'm you know I'll be sitting there and I'm, I'll do what you said. Explain it to me like I'm five. Explain it to me like you're explaining it to your grandmother. Um, Yes. And then I don't want to say when grandmother is like five, but like someone who's not very techie, who we'd want to try to bring along in this story and help, help them understand. Completely. And I think, you know, the more simply you can convey a message, the clearer it is. And so it's a great exercise. There's a quote may or may not be attributable to Mark Twain. I'm not sure, but it's like, if I had more time, I would have written you a shorter letter. And I think about that all the time because just because you can describe something really, really with a lot of complex jargon and it can make you sound really smart, that it can actually be an anti-goal. Like it, it can work against you more than it can work for you. And so to be able to describe something quickly, succinctly, clearly with basic language will go make you go much farther and will increase your impact significantly. And then I'll bear with me, this last one, oh, finally. I'm, I'm, last, I'm so interested in this. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fourth component of what I think are the, the various parts of a tone of voice are fun or serious. And this, again, comes down to your company and the speaker's authentic vibe. Are they trying to be fun? Does the company and the speaker's persona lend themselves to being laid back and chill and fun? Or are they really business focused? And does your company have a right to be fun or is the mission really serious and therefore you need to be serious to match it? So all of these are the spectrums. I think, you know, they can evolve over time and it's something that you play with. It's, it's not set in stone, but it's been a helpful resource to help context shift when you're managing a lot of different speakers. And it can also help you infuse all the different communications touch points with the right tone of voice. And when you start developing them, I've had fun with that. I've named a few, like uh, there's one that I call the straight shooter that I use often. And the straight shooter is, they're like right in between friendly and corporate, but they're very informative. They're more accessible and they're more serious. And then there's one that I also love, which I call Hey Bestie. And Hey Bestie is all about being really friendly, really conversational, super accessible, and also really fun. And that, again, depends on the authenticity of the person speaking, your company, the message, et cetera. And so I found that, Generally, having these frameworks are helpful for me to rely on both in like regular run of the mill comms and in comms that are a little more difficult to write, especially on very sensitive or charged issues. Yeah. I, I, as you're going through those categories, I love those categories because I, I know where I sit on those and it's probably a bit more fun and conversational and accessible. Uh, and then I got to thinking like, have I ever worked with leaders who might appear on that, that far spectrum of all in the other side? Um, do you have any experience with, I mean, I'm sure you do. Uh, do you have any advice for people who are um, struggling because maybe they have leaders who are wildly on the other spectrum from them? And how do you sort of push yourself a little bit more that way to, to think, to, to, to think like them and to set that tone, um, to set that right tone, because that can be tough if you are, Hey bestie. And then you, but your, your CFO or your CEO or whoever is really far in the other direction. There may, there may be some, not, there may just be some, some sticky, some sticky parts to that. Yeah. And I think it happens all the time, but I really do feel that the, the, job of the internal communicator is to be the acrobat. And you have to prioritize the natural inclination of the people who are speaking. And what I found for folks who are more technical or who are, you know, someone like the CEO has so much business context that 
it's not just about tone at that point. Once you understand what their tone is, you then need to layer on a significant amount of business context. And that's why I go back to, you know, one of the critical partners and relationships for an internal communicator are folks across the business in a strategy and operations type role or otherwise that can help you understand business context, business operations, business priorities, being able to understand those in your own mind can then help you write those communications more strongly in that tone of voice, even if you have your your own natural desire to make it very, hey, bestie. Uh, I, I think it's that that business context comes in and, and helps you balance out the two. Let, let's, let, I want to take a look at that from the lens of sort of what we've been seeing over the past couple of years, right? We have COVID, we've got a lot of, you know, really bad things, racial uh, injustice happening across the country. We are seeing layoffs now. So when you think about, you know, there, there's just a lot of negative, a lot of negative um, times, a lot of, lot of trying times happening here. So I'm wondering if we could talk about um, how, how our listeners can use tonal spectrum, maintaining voice. Uh, when leaders have to deliver these difficult messages, yeah, I this is really the moment when I have found these these frameworks to be most useful because in a crisis, you know, it can be really hard to respond authentically. Emotions are running high, the the crisis is still unfolding. You don't have all of the information, and you don't really know yet what to say or how to say it. And I go back to that prep session. I have the you know I have the framework in mind. I know the voice of the person who needs to speak. But going into that prep session and understanding, you know, talk to them, where does that compassion authentically lie and lean into that and then use that spectrum to help kind of determine the right framing of the message that needs to be delivered. And I think when it comes to something like a a social issue or another tragedy in our heart of hearts, we want to respond to everything. You know, we, we want to say something about everything because everything really does weigh on all of us as human beings. And but we, what we found is, you know, if you say your heart breaks for everything, then you're you're not really saying your heart breaks for anything. Your your voice is diluted. Your impact is watered down. And so, not to introduce yet another framework, but over the years at Etsy, we've refined how we respond to emerging issues like this by making sure that first any statement that we make is backed up with an action that gives a really tangible reason to be speaking. It's so hard to just say that you're sad that another thing happened, but to say. I'm sad and I'm doing this thing that helps give you a little bit of momentum to, to fill, fill in the rest of your message. And then just to go in a little bit deeper here, I, I referenced the Edelman trust barometer and last year's publication said something like 79 or 80% of employees expect their company to take an action on key societal issues. But, and this is where it gets like a little tricky, but the majority of employees want their CEO to stay out of politics. And so those responses are really talking about fueling policy, not politics, when you have a credible voice to add to the conversation. And so, like I said, we have this framework at Etsy where based on how close the issue is to our core business and our mission, we have varying levels of response that we've agreed upon to make sure that we're using our voice effectively, both internally and externally from, you know, a a targeted message to an ERG, to a much broader scale public statement or company donation. And Yeah, I think making sure that you only show up when it makes sense for you and your brand and when there's an action. Otherwise, it's just the more the more you speak about, the less you may say. And I think having these two frameworks to rely on, both the criteria that warrant which response and then the tone of voice for the author, it's just massively helpful in responding during during crisis mode and in a world where sadly it doesn't feel like the crisis, the crises, the tragedies will ever stop coming. Yeah. Yeah. There's so, there's so much. I mean, it it feels like it's a constant stream. I feel like if leaders only really respond, responded to everyone, that's all they would be doing is responding. Yeah. Let's get into our last segment, asking for a friend. I was asking for a friend. Hey. You've had an interesting and and fantastic variety of uh, career opportunities in the past, but thinking about employee communications, What's some advice you have for a first-time leader of employee communications? Oh, well, I would say three, three things. First, I've said it so many times, but like those friendships, those relationships, make friends. It's the best thing that you can do to be the most effective communicator. You'll understand, you know, what what employees need to hear. You'll understand what leaders need to say. You'll understand what needs to be done to promote the business really make friends across the business, level agnostic, org agnostic, tenure agnostic, everything. It's just, you know, 
invest in those relationships wherever you can. Then saying yes. I think so many things are uh, opportunities. It can seem like it's more work, but saying yes, how can I help? Even for something that might not immediately seem like internal comms. A lot of people don't understand what internal comms is. Use that to your advantage. Probably probably a lot of internal comms aren't aren't fully. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. It can really, it can be so many things. And so use that to your advantage. Like raise your hand and say yes to participate in things. That's where you can start building those relationships, especially in this distributed world and where you can really show your value so people think to you next time they need you. And then also getting to know the business. I think that's a huge unlock in the value that internal communicators can provide. Understanding the business, understanding the business priorities, the business context, the different parts of the business, how all of them work together, why they're all important, who does what, who, what personas each part of the business have. All of those things I think are, are really useful for, for first-time internal communicator leads. I love that. I love the second one because I've always been a person who says yes, and you just don't know what what you can learn or what you can get out of something. You may make some key contacts. You may learn something about the business that's helpful for you in a year from now. You know, there's just, there's so much opportunity there. I couldn't agree more, Catherine. What challenges do you think internal comms, employee comms, is going to face in the future? Let's let's say within the next five years. Yeah, I mean, we talked about this briefly. I. I really do believe relationships are everything and it's just, we don't know yet how to build new burgeoning, strong relationships in this distributed way. And so when we don't have those water cooler moments, when we don't have those run-ins, you know, how can we create those relationships, those very fateful relationships that help us so much that we love, that make our, our jobs exciting? How can we create those? And how can we also capitalize on those times where we are together? You know, if you do have to go into the office, if you do have a team event, if you do have a a company-wide gathering, how can you kind of strategize to make that work for you? Think of that as getting a lot of bang for your buck. You know, I think there's such an opportunity there. I, and it's hard to create those things out of thin air right now. So I think it'll be a challenge that we'll all be facing for the next five years. We'll all be trying to take advantage as much as we can, but there's also other folks are going to be trying to take advantage too. So like it's, it'll be difficult, but I'm, I'm optimistic that there will be a way for us to continue building strong relationships like this. We just, we just maybe haven't cracked that yet. Yeah. It's one of those where we're really, you know, re re rewriting our playbooks, right? Everything, how we were doing things four years ago is just not the same today. Even if, you know, you're primarily back in an office, it's changed because you may be dealing with companies who are all remote, Right. And then so now you may be working with people in other countries, you know, in wildly different time zones. Um, you know, yeah, it's it's just, it's really changed how we do in town halls. And it's all just so different how we interact with each other, like we talked about earlier. How to get how do you get to know employees? Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, even with new hire onboarding being remote for many employees, that too, that's such a critical moment for for folks to get to know the company and that is also something that affects overall employee engagement, which directly affects internal comms role. So, you know, I, I think it's it's something that we'll all be be facing and navigating over the next few years. Yes, as someone who has been a new employee during COVID, I can tell you, and not not where I work now, it's simpler, but uh, you know, employee employee onboarding is 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 really important to getting employees day one. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Because if, you know, if you just took, well, we used to do this in person, now we put it on Zoom and haven't really given any thought to their experience, right? That new employee experience and how you onboard them, uh, that can really, you know, impact, you know, employee turnover rates and, and yeah, engagement and, and, and satisfaction. Well, Catherine, everyone is trying to get better at their jobs. Uh, I feel like you just have a wealth of knowledge to share, but what do you do to get, to learn and get better at your job? I read a lot. Uh, I read a lot of both books that are fun to get better at writing and also just articles and stuff. There's such a wealth of knowledge that's um, being published on in the tech sector, especially. And so I find that as as critical curriculum. But things that I want to focus on, too, and I'm not really sure how to do this yet. I, I The last three years or so have just been like 12 Super Bowl quarters of like reactivity, right? Like it's We've just had to be on and it's a lot of the time it's been reactive. It's felt a little like, you know, you didn't know that something was going to emerge again in the midst of another crisis. And so there hasn't been much time to feel like you can pause, take a second, 
peek around a corner and feel prepared for whatever's coming. And so something that I want to focus on is building out frameworks, best practices, playbooks, something that will keep our team feeling ready and prepared should the next crisis event come around the corner rather than, oh no, start from ground zero. Like how, how do we address this? How do we solve this? Do we have anything that we can learn from? I think that's a big focus for, for my team. And then also management. Etsy takes management so seriously. We call it management as craft. It's something that's you know really important. And my team is growing right now as our company scales, which is amazing. I'm so excited about it. And so something that I'm focused on is how do I evolve the role of internal communications in a company that's growing? How do I evolve my career, but also cultivate the the growth of the members of my team? You know, how do I help them take risks and, and shine in a in a new environment as it's continually evolving? So I'll be focusing a lot on on management as well. And that's something that I don't think will ever end, I I think or I hope. Yeah. It's funny as you say that. I I want to share this story. Um before I, I, I left a job, uh, right before the pandemic started, and one of my last roles was I was putting together like literal playbooks for what happens for yeah. one of these 30 crises, whether it's a flood, fire, um, you know, the corporate plane crashes. Uh, and one of them was pandemic. Yeah, I know. Uh, but, but it was about like that being prepared and, and yeah. having the communications and who the contacts are and who needs to be in the, the war room these things happen. And it was just, it was just really smart, but I, I know it could have been a data breach, you know, all sorts of stuff. But I remember one of the tabs was pandemic and looking at that. And I, that was kind of my reaction. I just kind of laughed and I was like, yeah, I, I remember that that really stuck out to me. It's like four months later, pandemic. Yes. Um, and so, you know, I, wow. I, I, spooky. <laughs> I know so super spooky. Uh, so I, I think it's so interesting that, you know, you were talking about having, you know, being prepared and, you know, I highly recommend any listeners out there to, to be prepared and, and create an actual playbook for this stuff, because you just don't know when it's going to happen, but it's better to be prepared than, than sort of running around. Like, we don't know, you know, we, we got to figure this out, you know, we're building the train tracks as the, the train is flying down the, you know, flying out down the tracks. Exactly. And especially, you know, as, as you said about having those frameworks on hand, it's useful because when the crisis happens, you're charged. It's emotional. You're, you're responding to it personally and yeah. also needing to think how your company needs to show up. It's really, it's difficult. And I remember in COVID, especially after like the March rush, after we got those initial transfer to work from home, all of that, all of that transition, once we got those communications dealt with, we moved into the next tier of preparation, which was how this might affect our community in a potentially kind of scary way. And it was really difficult to get into the mindset of writing the communications if COVID were to, you know, if someone in our company were to fall victim to COVID. Yeah. And, or in your goodness, family, you know, like, fam- you know. The families yeah, of, um, of employees as well. We thought through all of the different iterations and thank goodness our, our company was, you know, was good on that front. But I remember doing it was so difficult, but afterwards I was so grateful to have that to rely on because imagine the difficulty of writing that in real life when you're processing it, dealing with it. I think having those things to rely on is so helpful and it's important to create the space to prepare for the worst, even though it's really difficult to to do and to get in that mindset and to write it and, and to respect that time that you have. But I think it's something that is useful moving forward. And we, like we said, we know that tragedies will keep on coming. Crazy events will keep on coming. Hopefully not another pandemic, but something big will come around the corner that we don't know yet. And it's good to have some basis to, to be able to rely on to move forward effectively. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, it's almost better to write them now when it's when you're not dealing with a crisis because it sort of it does disconnect you from that emotion. So that if you are found in that, that's fantastic advice, Catherine. This has been so much fun. I could talk to you forever. I love Etsy. I love what you do. I think you're you're amazing. You're great at you know employee communications, and I'm just I'm really thankful you were here today. Um, so, but, but before I let you go, let our listeners know where they can find you. Yes, absolutely. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm Catherine King, and uh, I'm looking forward to connecting with with anybody there. That's my. I'm not huge on social media, so that's the main one I'll use. But I look forward to connecting. And also, thank you so much, Amanda, for the time. I love Simpler. I'm such a fan of your company, and I really am so grateful for being a guest on the podcast. Yeah. Well, thank you, Catherine. This has been great.